let's start with a, uh, a story here. Tell us, tell us how you guys met, and and then maybe tell us about what you're going to talk about today. Well, first, you know, we'd like to welcome either the Siri pronouncement or pronounce pronunciation of Angela Pirelli, or or Angela Pirelli. That's Pirelli. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, how did we meet? Yeah. Well. He, uh, he, he, he swiped left, I think. Oh, God. <laughs> it was an accident. It was an accident. Was... <laughs> the phone was falling out of my hand. <laughs> Accidental yeah. swipe. Yeah. <laughs> so going on nine years ago, I started working at Air St. Gross, and Angela was there. And they said, stay away from that guy. You don't really want to talk to him. But then I did found out that we were both vets yeah I mean, not the animal kind even though you know lola would think otherwise today yeah uh, and just kind of hit it off as people who appreciated the profession beyond what it offers us you know <laughs> the idealized version <laughs> the, the idealized version of it yeah okay um, and just kind of hit it off and so what we're going to be talking about today is we've invited Angelo on the episode so that we can kind of talk about a road trip that he and I just uh, recently took, which was, um, we'll, we'll get into, you know, what it evolved into like name wise, but it was sort of uh, twofold. He may not know one of those folds, but one was just to really kind of like drive around, see each other since I moved, but to drive around and look at Midwestern architecture more of like the masterworks that are here, some of the things that we learned about in architecture school. But another one is, is that somebody is feeling a little disillusioned and I wanted to kind of get him out and show him that they're, you know, the uh, profession that he is well suited for, there are there is joy out there that he could He's painting a bleak picture of, of me. I wasn't sure. Th yeah. I wasn't sure though. He he could have been talking about himself there, Angelo. I I wasn't yeah. quite sure yeah. who the disillusioned I, one I, was going to be. Maybe it's I me. Think, <laughs> I think that was. I, to be quite honest with you, I think the trip um, was a little bit of a chicken noodle soup for the soul for both of us. To be quite honest mm, with yeah. you, mm. it was just one of these things that we had been talking about, kicking around about you know him coming out and visiting, kind of showing a little bit about Detroit itself, but then also getting out and going for a little drive. And funny enough, we learned that we can be in the same place for longer than maybe eight hours and not kill each other, mm -hmm. which was actually surprising and fun. But it was also a worry. Just, it, was, it was a worry. I was well, concerned. It was a concern before. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you This know, might not end well. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. It's just like, Oh man, you know, I mean, this is going to be like, we go camping and all that other stuff, but there's other people, there's, there's other victims. I mean, people around that, you right. know, we could, right. but, um, you can retreat, actually, but if you're both locked in the same car and you've got a road trip planned and you've got yeah. destinations and stops and all this stuff you've yeah. got to do together, like you gotta, you gotta and make it make just, work. <laughs> I know. And, and come on, honestly, you know, Evan, I know that you've seen the praises of Toyota, you know, this Toyota, that Angelo's got a Toyota. Um, and let's, just you wanted to check out the magic. Is that what, is that what I'm hearing? He, he no. felt the magic. He felt the yeah. magic. <laughs> oh my Lord. That uh, Toyota matrix is uncomfortable. Oh, oh no. Poor For, baby. Once again, once again, <laughs> like, like a Frank Lloyd Wright house, it fit me perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, uh, is that Cherokee red? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Or. We'll go, we'll go with sun faded, Baltimore tinged red. It's it's multiple reds if you're being accurate. Yeah, there exactly. Nice. Like, is this the original front quarter panel? Maybe, maybe not. All right. So, but, Angelo, I want you to lay out what the itinerary was, or what the idea oh, was, like where for where this all started, because everybody gets to hear Cormac talk enough on this know, podcast. We're going to get the Evan Trussell <laughs> interview. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm going to moderate this panel right now. <laughs> so I, let, let me start off by saying I, I've 
been to the Midwest, but usually just passing through. So I've never spent significant time there. I've, you know, flown through Detroit, been been in Ohio a few times, been to Chicago for like a weekend, but never really spent any time there. So I was interested in seeing, you know, seeing it, spending, getting a feel for it. When I go on vacations, I like to spend a few days in a place to just see at least, at least one weather change, um, you know? Yeah. Um, and so with Cormac moving out there, we were always like, Hey, let's get together. Let's, let's kind of spend some time there. So this was, um, I want in full disclosure, I'm on sabbatical, um, from work. So it was a perfect opportunity for me to just kind of spend some time with, with a, a good friend, but also see some things that I'd always wanted to see. Never, never seen Farnsworth house, never seen any of these places. And so we started laying out the trip and we were initially really <laughs> ambitious, right? Like. What's the name of that national park right south of Canada? Uh, so, you know, like what we were just recently talking about on like, oh, we got to hit all these like national parks and you want to get the stamps of all these national parks and yeah. stuff. Right. Angelo's very similar. And you know, he was just like, oh, we got to go to Isle Royal. Mm. And that is in, that is the large, most, it is the most unseen national park in all of the national park systems because it's an island in the middle of Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. And you've got to take boat, boat, boat plane. Exactly. And and so he you know, we were like, oh, we'll do that. You know, and then so we this was like, on the list. This was on the this list. Was on the list. Yes. And this is this big, massive kind of like you know, here I am talking about, oh, we've got to see all of the Sullivan Banks. No, they're not next to each other. Right. <laughs> Isn't that on Sullivan Bank Row? That's where yeah. all of them are, right? Exactly. It's just like, oh, they're just right down the street from each other. No, they're all over the place. Mina, you know, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio. Isn't it Ohio? I mean, yeah, we were, yeah there's we, one in Ohio. Yeah, um, Iowa, all of these At other places. At what point did you like dis realize that there were delusions of grandeur with the planning of this? Oh, this almost trip? immediately. Oh, okay, but good. but yeah. you have to entertain them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because because we had we had a Google we had a Google Maps kind of session where we were just like throwing stuff in there. Oh, if we're going to be here, you know, we're not too far from, you know, and it not too far from. So, what's interesting is, and again, this kind of harkens back to like what you and I were talking about. Is that the further and further you get away from the East Coast, the bigger and bigger the states get. And so, when you say they're not too far away from each other, in the Mid Atlantic or East Coast. That means that they're like, well, I can get from DC to New York City in four hours. Or in in the Midwest, it's like once you start getting a further into like the bigger states, you know, it means that four hours, it's like, oh, I'm still in the same state. You might hit a rest stop in four hours if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when we were like, you know, the delusions of grandeur of like, oh, we could do this and this. It's just like, wait, how many miles is this? And then we were like, can we do this? Eh, maybe we don't want to do it. it is, mm. So we also, so in planning it, once once we got past that point of like, okay, there's too much here. We we really needed to scale back and say, okay, we, we want to have some time in between to go on detours to check out something here and there. And so we tried not to put every day just chuck full of stuff. And so I'll, I'll kind of lay out, tried. Um, we'll I'll try to lay out just outline style, kind of what it ended up being. So okay. day one, I, I was coming into Detroit again, hadn't spent any time in there. I wanted to kind of get my first impressions of this place that I'd heard so much about from various people, both architects and non-architects, just wanted to see kind of how, uh, you know, white flight had impacted a place. And so just first impressions of Detroit, that was day one for me, a little bit initially by myself and then with, um, great tour guide um of of and and we can get into my to first impressions and particularly the impressions of detroit counterpoint gross point um <laughs> and then um so that first day we we decided to stay around that area and so cormick had been to a couple of places that that he wanted to see again smith house cranbrook what was the second frank Lloyd Wright house uh affleck house affleck house and then we were going to shoot into Detroit and do the, the tour of Detroit proper. While in Detroit, I, I needed to get to Coney's because I needed a hot dog if I'm in Detroit. Um, and so 
that was on our list. He, you know? he, he asked, he asked around, it's like, you know, well, you know, he, he'd asked me, it was just like, what is like the, the food of Detroit? There's the Detroit style pizza and all this other stuff. And then he asked a couple of other friends and Coney kept coming up, you know, and then Lafayette Coney is like one of the originals in downtown Detroit had to do that, you know, Got it. just had to. And, and it was kind of important to me, right? Because well, you got to eat. eat, you got to eat, eat, but you got to experience eat. architecture both as like, all right, I'm going to a Sullivan bank or I'm going to a friend, but I also need to go to a place that's just a place like that people go to. Yeah, um, right. And, and I, and I think, you know, that's important. It's, it's a part of architecture and it's a place where you make memories. So, um, Makes sense. so after day one, you know, we decided we we're just gonna, am I, I'm leaving out a lot, right? Well, but I mean, okay. So <laughs> here's the question, Mr. Moderator fella. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want us to go in depth on the list as we talk about it or kind of go through like, you know, the big picture of what we did? And then kind of come back to it. Yeah. Well, I, it, it's proving to be difficult for you guys to just provide the outline because you want to tell all the little details. So I guess I think True. we're going to have to go chronologically here so that we get okay. the whole story. Yeah. But but if you were to sum up what this trip is in one sentence, give everybody an idea of what they're going to hear on this episode. Okay. So we came up with a title. I think it was day two. And it was as we were visiting the non kind of like classical architecture, we had used, so, you know, another bit of like full disclosure, Angelo and I worked on that Hopkins project that you've heard me talk about often. We were partners on that and we worked on that. And one of the things that we did there and one of the things that he pulled up when we were working on some of the details was Renzo's Chicago Institute of Art edition. And as like, you know, some of the things that we were looking at on what we wanted to do with some of the window details and stuff. And, and so, you know, he was kind of excited about wanting me to go see that, you know, because I hadn't actually seen that and he has, and he remembers it from back when it had opened, when it was new and fresh and all of that other stuff. And what was interesting is as we're rounding the corner, I see his face before I see the building kind of like drop a little of like, oh man, you know, <laughs> and he knows because he knows me and you know me that I'm going to start to like say, huh, okay, it's rusting, it's staining, it's, and that's of course what I've started to do. And so what we ended, so there's, there was kind of like a, a title that we had started to look at just things that because of stuff, the way we were talking about things and the way that it was called the idea and the, and execution, it was this kind of like big, broad idea of, it's just like, you know, when we're looking at all of these buildings, the classical architectural masterpieces and the new ones and all of this other stuff, it's like, how is that idea? What is the big idea and how did it get pulled through to execution? Got and it. then... And, and you're going to have to remind me why we started saying blossom of the soul. Oh man. I, you're, my memory is poor. I remember us saying this and I, all right, maybe it'll come out as we start to go. Yes. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> cause I, cause I, st I wrote it down as kind of like a subtitle to idea and execution, you know, and it was the blossom of the soul. And I don't know if it was like in one of, one of the restaurants we were at or something like that. But it was just, it was, it was something that was just like, you know, in a way you can start talking about that because like, we're all very passionate about architecture. I mean, you, you and I've been talking about mm -hmm. architecture in the past 12 years. Angelo would be, you know, perfect fit to this conversation because that's what we do when we get together, the same thing. And so we really do believe in like what architecture can do for us. And, and so, you know, this blossom of the soul is something that sounds cheesy, but could be something that like really kind of fits this broader image of like why we were on this kind of trek, not just looking at the architecture, but as Angela was saying, experiencing it, seeing how it fits and makes the place. We were talking about making of places and spaces and what's the difference between the two. I mean, we, we were talking very high design to low design, how it all fits together and how it mixes, mixes and matches and mushes all together to, mm. to become what it is to, to a space. 
And it's, Im- it's important for what the yeah. next person, the second person to come along does to making, to making place, right? That first mm-hmm. per- person comes in and they do a great building and then someone else comes along, you know, Re- responds they, to it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that in of itself is, is super important for whether this is successful for a place yeah. or not. Um, and, and you can kind of see that in some of these buildings, a lot of these buildings and a lot of these places that we went to, it was, it was kind of, it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. I mean, because there's a lot of times where we, we make spaces and we can make really, really good spaces, but do they make really good places? Yeah. You know, do they integrate and become something greater than? And, and as we were going through in like seeing all of this stuff, that's kind of like where the conversation sort of went. It was like these weird little ongoing debriefs while we were there looking at it, talking about it and just kind of like sh- spewing all of this stuff. Yeah, there's kind of a subconscious layer to it, right? Which is, it, it's like the poetic side of it. Like to, to really yes. kind of dial in on your, you know, the blossoming of the soul mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Like there's this connection. Yeah. It is subconscious at some level. It may have to do with the the exact conditions of the day you meet. It might have to do mm-hmm. with the people who were there. It, it may just yeah. have to do with the architecture. It may have to do with the quality of the space or the light. And like, it's, it's very personal at that, at that yeah. moment, but it's also like, that's what makes architecture architecture, right? It's kind of this poetic nature of, of it being something bigger than just the assemblage of parts in this particular way. So I'm, I'm really interested that you set an intention going into this, right? It wasn't just like, we're going on a road trip. We're going to see some stuff. It was like this idea of, of approaching it as a, as like this overarching, idea to execution like you're looking at it through a lens right i think that that's kind of interesting for an architectural field field trip it seems appropriate i'm interested to hear how that turned out because cormac you you get out the magnifying glass sometimes like talking about a lens right like you you're like that this exact detail right here like the execution and it's like so so because it is it's a balance of both right it's like what was the big idea what are some of the medium-sized ideas? And then how how does it actually perform? I think all of that's valid in the critique of architecture. But most importantly, you're actually going to experience this in person, on yeah. purpose, with this yeah. intention. And I don't think enough of us do that enough at the time, right? And so, like, we just got to spend some time in Washington, D.C. and do that exact same thing. And so you got to extend this idea beyond hmm. your guys' road trip. So, it's like, you're yeah. in a special... You're in the special special bus, Cormac, all on your own of of getting to do, you know, like you're you're walking the talk here. This is it is, so I I'm I'm jealous of of your special bus, Cormac. So, but, so Evan, Evan, when you when you go when you go, do you go with the idea of I'm you know because when I go around with architects, we all say, well, why would they do this? What is this? How look how they brought this together? Mm-hmm. And and we've practiced. We've we we know that sometimes the the best. Uh, Best laid plans of mice and men, right? You know, um, right. Th- there are things that you draw to come together a certain way. The contractor doesn't bring it together that way, or yeah, you when get you're like not cuts. like that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> and so when I go to see, th- particularly when I go to see contemporary stuff, I am less, I am less critical than a, f- a little bit less critical than Cor- Cor- Kiss because um, I. I I, I've been there. I know what it takes. Yeah. And so I'm looking at it like, okay, what was the big idea and how successful is it? How does it make me feel? You know, was it, you know, did yeah. they get 90% of it, 80% of yeah, it? Yeah, right? I agree with that because we don't know what was on the table at the time to to make it happen. We have no idea yeah. who decided what or why or how much it was going to cost or, you know, like what, there's so many train wrecks waiting to happen in the construction process <laughs> so, and and you only get to see the final outcome you don't yeah. get to see why all of that stuff unfolded the way that it did and so i i, I tend to like you give them the benefit of the doubt and say okay what 80 percent? okay 80 20 rule right, right. How, how do i feel about this um rather than really digging in too deeply on the details and just because because you'll just disappoint yourself <laughs> like let's be honest <laughs> <laughs> and if they nail it, and if they nail it, then I'm like, oh, okay, man. Yeah, Over the moon. you did it. You they, did it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, look, there's, so, you know, coming, coming out of, you know, in. Defend yourself. <laughs> well, I, I will, because, so at the last AIA convention in, in San Francisco, when I walked mm-hmm. down to the, you know. The federal courthouse. The federal courthouse. 
And I looked at that and there's some amazing moves, amazing, like big ideas about that. And then I kind of took a look at it and, and did kind of like my typical thing. I was like, oh man, you know, but then I was just like, you know what? I was just like, I get it. Like, I know, cause mm -hmm. I've been in the room too, where it's just like, yeah, well, we want to change this or we want to do that or the design by committee or a contractor who can't really execute a detail or a design and stuff like that. In I don't think that's uncommon with Morphosis projects either. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like you see that these two things don't come together the way that they were envisioned, like right. because of a variety of reasons. So exactly. Yeah. And so I was just yeah. like, you know what? I mean, in, so we'll talk a little bit about like the, so like on this long road trip, I mean, so let me just kind of set a, a picture for everybody and kind of rewind a little bit. So, you know, Angelo comes into Detroit and we go, uh, to, we, we drive around Detroit and then we're, you know, we make our way to Chicago and we spend a couple of days in Chicago and then out in the rural area of, uh, Illinois to, you know, go to places like the Farnsworth house. And then, you know, kind of a little bit back into Detroit and then up into Wisconsin and then through Wisconsin, uh, up to, you know, like Milwaukee and then out in, out to, um, Madison and then, you know, do a little bit of the Frank Lloyd Wright trail. And, you know, so like it was, it was big. I mean, there was a lot of things we did and we saw a lot, lot of, of ground. We Jeez. covered a lot of ground, a lot of mileage. And thankfully it wasn't a Toyota though, cause they could at least handle it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, there was, there was one time where we had revisited a, a building that I had kind of a somewhat, you know, adverse reaction to the first time I saw it because there was a couple of things that weren't working on it the first time I saw it. And kind of jumping ahead a little bit, it was the, you know, Milwaukee Museum of Art, Calatrava. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, you, you've heard me talk about this. It's just like the, you know, the mechanics of the wings when they were opening up were, they were mm. off sync. And so it was, it didn't quite open up the way that it, you know, it wanted to, where the wings didn't spread exactly the right way. And it was just like, you know, half spread, half like. Oh, broken, kind of like, broken yeah, wing. Broken. Yeah. And then, you know, I was just looking at some of the details and like buffer scars and all of this other stuff. And, you know, you did the same projects <laughs> as like, right. you know, you know, um, <laughs> as Angelo and I do, where it's just like, we get beaten down by like maintenance has got to do this maintenance has got to do that kind of thing. And so I was a little kind of like ticked off it. I was just like, you know, these people are spending millions, probably billions on projects where we have to like, we get the budget, the budget budgets and we have to do things, this, this kind of responsibility to the committee, responsibility to maintenance and stuff. And so it was kind of like ticked off And you know, just like when you and I were sitting next to each other at that, um, keynote at the very beginning, when I texted you and said, you know, I was wrong. I right. told Angelo, I was like, well, I was wrong. I, this is friggin' amazing. Mm, so the revisit, the round the re, two was, the revisit, was better. Yeah. The revisit got to me and it was just. It was this kind of like, you know, either visiting, revisiting, or kind of like looking at some really interesting things through uh, a different perspective mm -hmm. that also just sharing it with somebody else who has, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I won't say that we have similar opinions, but we have, you know, that we're looking at it as, you know, lenses of architects. Similar sensibilities, right? Yes. Like, like, yeah. yeah, because if you, I, I know what you mean, <laughs> how many times have I been to a, a, an amazing place with with somebody who just doesn't care about about it at all it's it's a yeah. completely different experience than than experiencing it with somebody who is totally into it so but that's that's interesting though is because when we get into you know places like that like say when three architects walked in, into a piece of architecture you know <laughs> you, you've got this like you know, like everybody has kind of got this sensibility. They may see it in a, a slightly different way or something, but we're, sure. we're going to be talking about it similarly. We're going to talk about, you know, like the procession and all of these other things that how the, these captured moments and all of these other like l weird things that only we picked stuff. up. On. Yeah. Right. But like when we're giving presentation and we overdo it on the Arca speak and, you know, we kind of give them the architect's version of the conversation rather than the, you know, the person who we're building it for, which doesn't care about the same things that we do, doesn't experience it the same way we do. 
I'm actually somewhat more interested in listening to their story about how they experience it more so because that's what we really learn. You know, that's when we really like say, oh, this is what people are looking I mean, for this when is... we design things. Inside baseball versus, you know, an outsider's point of view. I mean, there's room for all of it is my, is the reason I say that. Like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it, that's normal that every oh, yeah, single yeah. field there is. Right. Uh, I think that that happens, but, um, I'm interested, like th- we're never going to get through all the projects that you guys no, saw. I, I don't right? think so. Yeah. I think maybe so, we hit the high yeah. Yeah, I want to definitely hear the highlights. But if you can give a sense of okay, you you mentioned a bunch of different states you drove through. If if you have a rough number, like how many projects or places did you actually see? We average between seven and ten per day. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> it. But then, like Oak Park was just like we did. Like we we saw a couple bunch of, of drive bys. Yeah. yeah, we did. We did a few highlights where we went to. Unlike what you and I did when we went to Oak Park and we walked up to Unity Temple and they're like, oh, do you want to take the tour? And we were like, oh, we don't have time. You know, well, we, we did. probably walked up or walked through at least 20 projects, I would say. Nice. nice. Per at day least. or per? No. Uh, walked up or walked through. We drove. Well, we drove. no, because I'm looking at the list that I have that, yeah. you know, I, Evan, you're going to have to help me on this uh, for the edit. I, I want to kind of do a Star Wars scroll. Of, oh, of all of, of the, uh, all, all the be, projects? Of all of the projects. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you right now that, you know, it was... And see, so, like, when we say, you know, like, you were saying 20, l- let's just take Cranbrook, for instance. You know, okay, Cranbrook, so Cranbrook was one. Cran- on on, on Angela's <laughs> like you list, say, Cranbrook You say Cranbrook is one. is one, but Cranbrook is, is Cranbrook the campus. Cranbrook is many. Yeah, <laughs> Cranbrook is many. And so, okay... Let me let me back up to Cranbrook though. So one of the yeah. interesting things, this is one of the things that was kind of like this key to like how we we package this tour is just like a lot of it is like stuff that we learned in school that we may not have actually like gone to when we were learning about it. Sure, and all of these course. different precedents. Yeah. And so Angela was telling me, he was like, Hey, you know, um I, I see that Cranbrook's nearby. I want to go to Cranbrook. And then as we're there, he's kind of telling me about and I, I I'm going to tell you my quick version and then Angela, you kind of dig into yeah. this. It's just like, yeah. And he was just like, I learned about this in school and we learned about like this philosophy of like thresholds and stuff at Cranbrook. I'm like, oh, we got to go. We got to go. And so, like, you're there. Yeah. So, first of all, we, we, we get there and we were driving around and I'm seeing all of the things that I'd only seen in pictures, right? And how, you know, the the end of one building comes up to the chimney of another and how they're just kind of talking to each other one goes in the other one goes out and they're just they just have this little dialogue but the silhouette of them create a gateway a threshold a, th- a thing to pass through and so you know archie nerding out on it like oh wow I've, I've seen this picture i've drawn this right i've drawn this from a picture I've, I've used this when i'm designing silhouettes to to kind of do the same thing and so it was it's a pretty it was a pretty spectacular moment for me. But, but then we get out and you start walking through it and you see, um, one, this this notion, to bring it back to this idea and execution, where you're walking up and you're seeing the details. You're seeing, again, how a space that you think is is square, for instance, is hmm. actually not. It's it's just sort of slightly canted to right. accentuate that idea of of gateway and threshold. So you look at it from one side, and you are just seeing the silhouette because the rest of the, the building sort of dies, you know, moves away from you, and so you can't see the sides. And you come from the other side, and it looks like an elongated, uh, uh, you know, like Looney Tunes, right? You know, it looks like the elongated uh, train forced tunnel perspective, right? Yeah, yeah, and that forced perspective, and and you don't get that in the book right and and so there's the idea of gateway there's the idea of threshold but then the execution is something richer Mm -hmm. or in in this case it was richer in other cases you're like oh huh but um but in this case there were all these little moments like that where um the big idea drilled down into the details and that i think was the the, one of the first times we started talking about idea and execution this this notion of of, hey, this is the idea of Gateway, but here's how it's executed here. 
here's how it's executed here. And then on a few steps, and that's why Cranbrook was just a really rich experience. In just a few steps, you could kind of experience it completely differently from one place to another. The other thing that was interesting, again, uh, going back to that of what the second person does, right? You know, there's Saarinen the elder, Saarinen the younger, both kind of talking to each other through buildings yeah. in this place. It, it was, it, it, again, just, I, I don't know that I have my head wrapped around everything, but, you know, that that's just a little bit of a taste of kind of what it was to actually be there after studying this thing for years. So I don't know how this is going to come across, but I'm going to share my screen real quick. And, and I want to... Okay. I want to show this kind of uh, notion that we were talking about. And it's just this, this one. So, so this, this, this is this, it's, it's a rectangular building and it's got a tunnel cut through it and it's kind of punctuated by a sculpture and then kind of like the green that, you know, of the trees and stuff beyond. So you're drawn into it, right? And you, you would want to walk through it kind of like very similarly to like that, that, that force perspective that we were talking about at the air, you know, Udvar Hazy air and space, right? Right. You know, right. Where you see like the goal of where you want to go and you just kind of like want to walk to it. So we're walking up to it and we're walking through this. And interestingly enough, when you get into the space here, we realize when we're standing on this side, we realize, oh, this is really kind of cool. And you see this like beautiful brick work and it, you know, creates the vaulted ceiling and all that other stuff. And then we walk through. And then it, like, I've been through this tunnel countless times and it, it only took the lens of another architect who just kind of picked up and said, they're not the same size. Like, it's like, what just happened? I, I, so he, Angelo noticed something that you've never noticed and you've it, been there a yeah. bunch of times. Right. And so, so I like counted off steps across here and then I walked over here and I counted off steps to walk to the other side and I'm like, it's like two, two feet, three feet wider on one end than it is the other. And again, it's not, you know, it's, and it's just like, you're creating this like force perspective tunnel view of, I want you to focus in on that sculpture at the end of the tunnel. And it was just like, who does this? And then we were sitting there and just kind of <laughs> completely dumbfounded by, Hey, let's we're, we're looking at the, the brick patterns and it's just like, I don't see cut brick how, or I don't how see did like, they do it. Yeah. How we're like, why do architects look up? We're looking up like, wait, yeah. how does that brick come together? <laughs> <laughs> we you need to the, figure the, this the out. Matrix math coming down in front exactly. of your eyes. Yeah. yeah. And, Interesting. And, I mean, and, and the crazy thing to me about this is like the expense that it actually takes to do something like that. I mean, like you said, Cormac, it wasn't yeah. even perceptible to you uh, out of countless visits. Right. And yet, subconsciously like angelo picked up on it right there's something something's going on here like what just happened kind of a thing and it's so expensive to do moves mm -hmm. like this especially that no one's going to really notice like for the right. most mm -hmm. part nobody notices this right uh, it is a, it is really a subconscious thing and and i mean that's kind of a shame right thinking about practicing architecture today and the materials that we use and the budgets and the time frames and who's who's even willing to build what when it comes to right. these, especially on public projects, right? It's just like, yeah. we, we get this kind of stuff that like this would never even be considered in a VE conversation. <laughs> of course <laughs> we're getting rid of that, right? It doesn't have 90 degree angles. Exactly, yeah. Right, and and so it's, it's, I mean, that's one of the cool things about visiting a master work, right? It's like you're picking up on this stuff, but that they actually did it to, mm -hmm. is just incredible. And so as Angela was talking about it, so when you went through that tunnel, and you went past that, that sculpture there, you had this choice to go down the stairs. And when you went down the stairs, what you don't see in that perspective that he created with that tunnel was once you get down to the bottom of the steps and you turn left, you're staring right at this. It's mm -hmm. this kind of like series, this layering effect of like these thresholds and these kind of moments of, I got you focused here. Once you mm -hmm. get there, you're like, oh, oh. You know, you know where to go next. It's that, it's that, it's that idea of taking you on access, taking you off of access. So you, when you get to that statue, you have a choice. You can look down and mm -hmm. that, that alley of trees kind of blocks your view of, of, of what's on the screen right now. And mm -hmm. so you have to come off of access, right? You have to get mm -hmm. off of your path of travel 
go down the stairs, turn around, and then you reorient yourself, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm oriented in a completely different direction. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's that again, and th- there's another gateway, there's another threshold, there's another way of passing through something. Um, and in order to get to it, can you walk straight to it? Are you on access? No, you have to go to the sides, go back around, go up the stairs, come back to be back on center. It was almost like creating a fun house. Like, you know, you had to kind of go through, you know, it's like, oh, I go through this threshold, you know, option A, out the front gate, option B. Choose your own adventure. You know, you go, right. ex- oh, yes. And it was so amazing to kind of like see the, and for me, you know, like Angelo was talking about, I learned about this and I learned about this concept of gateways and thresholds and things like that. And so as we're walking through it, I'm just like, I now I'm looking at it as a completely different way than I did the first time, second time, third time I went there. I'm looking at it as a collection of buildings. Now I'm looking at it as a ke- collection of thresholds and movements mm-hmm. through a space that are are connected in a, in a completely different way. That mm-hmm. walking through with my wife, the non-architect, I'm seeing just good spaces and good places. Now I'm seeing this this larger composite that just it. That's why architects should like travel with architects. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy that you found your spirit animal here, at Kermit. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you should take that, Angelo. Yeah, uh, he's as long as a, ma- a majestic spirit animal. I'm, I'm cool. Right. He's a he's a badger. <laughs> he's a honey badger. Yeah. All right. That that sounds incredible. Uh, that's so, that's definitely one I need to put on my short list of yeah. places to and, experience. And you know, it's funny, Angelo. So like, I've on countless occasions while driving through um, Cranbrook, I've sent pictures of the gates and all of that other stuff to Evan. He was like, "Dude, you got to check this out." And I keep thinking, it was like, I want to walk through this with other architects to show them what I'm seeing. And then, you know, let's, let's talk about another thing. Somebody on this conversation has this penchant to try every door (laughs) (laughs) to whether you're supposed to really be there or not. Is going to try every door. Ask for forgiveness later. Right. (laughs) You know, there was, there was a bit of trespassing that had been done on this trip. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Why would you try every door? (laughs) <laughs> it's a what was great though is you know i had no real intention of going into the library at that that view that i showed you you know i had no real intention of going into the library and when you go into the library uh and i'll pull this up <laughs> in a second here here he is he's trying he's like you, um, you open the door and there's a person right yeah, there and he you know, <laughs> right behind the door Right. You, 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 you walk in and, you know, of course this is beautiful and that's incredible. You know, yeah. the thing that's amazing about it is this, the pattern on this door, once you open that door, you're in a vestibule. And then right behind that is the glass doors that then lead you into the reading room of the library. And that pattern is replicated in the doors, the, the glass doors, the wooden glass doors. And then you see this like this movement here and you look straight up to the ceiling and you see that pattern up in the the soffit of the breezeway and you see that pattern kind of like replicate on these the way that they carved out it's all the um, same language i mean it's all the same language and it was just this incredible like thing and so then and i'll i'll try to quickly jump through uh there's the exterior of it but then you go into this space and it's just like these so very kind of like clean and beautiful and just like Not simple great. and yeah you know and then those lights i was just like enamored by the lights i'm like oh my god these lights are you know insane and it's like i'd love to have one of these in my house yeah you know? my experience has been oh maybe 60 percent of the time you walk into a place and they look at you like what are you doing here and you say you know it used to be hey i'm a student and or I'm an architect and I, I'm enamored with this building. They'll say one of two things. You can't be here. Oh, oh, are you now? Come on in. <laughs> and so, you know, why not take, why not shoot your shot? Yeah, um, exactly. And they, they were, they were gracious. They were, they were really gracious. They were like, hey, come on in, take a look. You know, they just let us walk around in that library. Yes. And so. Oh yeah. Um, they were, they were like, they would have let us stay there and talk to them and all this other stuff. Sleep on the floor. They're like, oh. 
you should go and check out the basement. All of these other things. They were just, they was, they were great. You know, yeah. um, what an amazing, because it's an art school, what an amazing collection of books. I mean, I could have just sat there and just read the books because they've got like everything from stuff that's, you know, dear to us, like a Bauhaus and all of that other stuff to like all these amazing artists and everything else. Yeah, it was just Finding incredible. somebody at a place who knows something about it is just yeah. like the key to unlocking something yeah. incredible. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and to me, like those have been my most successful projects is when there's somebody on the owner's side, you know, whether they're like the actual user of the space or they're a part of the administration or whatever. And there's some piece of the story of the project that they latch onto and tell people who mm -hmm. come to the project. Yeah. That's the person you want to find because when yeah. they say, oh, you've got it. Oh, you're interested in architecture. You need to know about this. Yeah. That's when it's like, that's that's when it opens up. And your point, your point about finding that person on the client team is is absolutely spot on too. If you find that person that's passionate about something, right. that can embed that passion into a project, it's hard to then kick it out. Right? We talked about totally. what gets VD ownership. To eat. It's like, yeah, right. no, this this is yeah, this is the heart of the project. This is the thing that's making the project the thing. Uh, this is what's blossoming your spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or your soul. So if you, I think it's important to find that person when you're visiting, but it's when you're practicing, it's also important to find that person in every project. Sometimes you have to be that person, but if that person is on the client team, it, it makes it hard for them to say, yeah, chuck that out. No one will notice right. this. Absolutely. And so one of the things that we kind of, we're always talking <laughs> about, yeah, we're always talking about Aeroserin. And we know that there's the father and son team of the Saranans. And I don't really know how many people know or appreciate the skill or just the the whimsy that Daddy Saranin brought to a lot of his projects. <laughs> Papa, Papa Saranin. <laughs> yeah, Papa Saranin. Yeah. Because this is similar to that, that archway where there was mm -hmm. that sculpture at the end you're on axis with that, with this almost sculpture, this, this lantern at the corner of this building. And again, you're starting to get these like peekaboos into these spaces. And then the thing about it is, is that when you, you know, pass through this archway and get beyond it, again, it's one of these opening up to like this kind of like just wonders of all of these other spaces that are around there that mm -hmm. you had no idea when you're standing here looking at that. You know, that mm -hmm. archway that you had no idea what was beyond that archway. And it was such this, this beautiful staging that this guy did, which was just like, I mean, like, I was, you check out that composition. Like, <laughs> like you yeah. have that, you have that, that, that archway. And then within that archway, you have that, you know, doorway that's, well, first of all, it's centered, right? So yeah. the, the edge of the building is centered on the archway where mm -hmm. we're standing. And we, we managed to place ourselves directly in this pathway. And then right. you have, I mean, how, how, I wonder how much did they think about how much was happenstance? How much, how much did they like, you know, did they draw this? Like, so I would draw this view if I were doing this today and be like, okay, this, this needs to be composed. But then look how the landscape sort of just creeps in from the right and helps tonally balance what's in that archway. I mean, it's just, it's just so it's damn like, good. It it's made like me they mad. designed those leaves there. Yeah. 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 It, it, did they? I don't know. Did they just have a really good yeah. landscape architect that understood? And I, I don't know how many times I was standing there just with a look of disgust on my face because yeah. they were yeah, so they good. It look, it's, yeah. it's, it's so good. But it's just so well balanced, so well composed. And then that little, the way those leaves sort of peek out, you know there's more beyond Right. To, to the left. And so you want to go down there and kind of. And then there's these like, like weird little moves or weird little moments that were just amazing. It was these, and I kind of called them leaning posts because I could, <laughs> I could put my shoulder on there and just stand there. And it was, but you just kind of like have these like little movements and like, this is a window that then when you kind of go back, you've got kind of that implied window you know, mm -hmm. in the arch. And then when you went back, you kind of saw that arch open up to be these like windows onto the courtyard. And it was just these series of moments that you just kind of, and then once you get past it, boom, you like open up and you start to see all of these other things that kind of like create this like <laughs> massive tapestry of like, 
other things. And then you start to see other thresholds opening up and then you're like, oh, I got to go there. You know, and it's just like, you, you just kept wanting to see more and see more. And he didn't disappoint because there's all these moves and all these moments where then, you know, you same as like on the other side. So this is that building that is, you know, in, in like that element right there, that, that kind of fountain is the same element as the fountain and the lantern on the other side. But on this side, it's a little bit different because it's now open and then you've just got these alignments and, and everything else. And it was just like, I mean. Also say here, we talked a bit about photography here, right? Because these shots are awfully well balanced in terms of light, right? So you move through these thresholds and some of them are a lot darker than these photos are, are kind of. Right. And so, you know, the rhythm of light to dark is also present as you're moving. Mm -hmm. And so that threshold, you know, I'm making fun of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings being small, but there, that, that sense of at least tonal compression and then walking out into a space that's brightly lit because all of a sudden the sun's back on you, that rhythm, that light is, is there as well. And so again, that's part of that threshold. And again, part of something that you may or may not see in pictures, depending on the intent of the photographer. And so right. everyone should just sort of visit because or the number of photos that you can get into the budget. Right. So like you're talking about a, a progression <laughs> yeah. and it's like, okay, we've got eight shots to tell the story of this project because that's what we can afford to do because that's what we can do in a day. And that's how long we can pay. For. But you're talking about here, like the actual experience of yeah. Yeah. all of this and, and taking yeah. the time to go through it. Like this isn't about efficiency for, and, and not, the campus isn't even about efficiency. It's not about getting you from one place to another no, as fast no, as possible, right? No. And so when you, you talk about idea to execution to experience, like that to me is kind of the, the Venn diagram here, like an experience it being in, in the middle of, of idea and execution and for a, a really successful experience for you to, to feel that in all of these different ways on all of these different levels while visiting this is, is really really amazing yeah because i mean and we're never going to get to more projects if you don't get past the first one we're never going to get past it i i, I totally <laughs> agree with you nor <laughs> nor do I, because i mean these are like the things that and then so then you've got the son who says all right dad anything you can do i can do better <laughs> and it does these things that you can sort of see right here is one of his dad's buildings and how he transitions to like his his additions and all of this other stuff. And they're just like these, mm -hmm. these moments of the, the convergence of like the two serenins together. And then there's the, here's how I treat the threshold. He, no, here's how I treat the threshold. And they're just these beautiful moves of like, of composition, of light, of shadow, of sound. I mean, when, so this was a picture that was taken actually not when Angelo and I were there, but when my wife and I were there just a week later, when I had completely forgotten after, um, after everything that I had signed up for a, a Japanese garden tour on, on the campus. And so like, I take her back and we're, we're in there and then what's not here, but so this is when we came through it, but to, to go to the Japanese garden tour. But then as we were coming back through it, there was a guy who was sitting there and he was playing the guitar and what was amazing about it. And I don't have a picture of that, but how that particular space, the acoustics and everything else just really kind of broadened and it enriched that space even more beyond what's like that, what that notion that Angela was talking about of like the second person, you've got yeah. the architect who's got his opinion. Now you've got the musician who's got his opinion and you've got all of these other ones who have this other thought and stuff. And it's just, that was what we were looking for. And that was where the, you know, the, the blossoming of the soul part of this all came into is just like looking at stuff like that. I was at a, at a project, a, a Billy Chen, Todd Williams project in uh, La Jolla. It's a neurosciences institute. And at this camp, it's a very small campus. It's near the Salk Institute. Uh, there is a performing arts theater. And like Angelo, I walked in the door. I just walked in the door. And there was a, a violinist and a pianist playing inside the performing arts theater theater it's a small theater but it transforms a building into something else entirely yeah. it turns it into an instrument yeah. right and and it was 
my wife and I were the only two people there. We're peeking our heads through the door, taking this in. And it was like a transformative experience. I mean, it was, you, you don't get to do that very often. You don't get to experience that very often. It's total serendipity happening. Mm -hmm. You just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And that additional layer where somebody is making use of the building as a tool to do something else is absolutely uh, incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's why I don't agree with Frank Roy the right placing the furniture where it is because the, I think the people get in there and they, they make it go. I, I know what you're going to, where you're going and they can mess it up. They nope. can mess it up, but all right. Well, but, no, 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 go ahead. You, you, you're no, but them living in the space makes it their own. It makes it alive. It, you know, it's we're, we. I think we provide the opportunity for something to happen. But seeing the thing happen, seeing life happen, that's the magical part. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what's really special about seeing spaces occupied by people using them, either in the way they were intended or not. That makes it really, really uh, special. Um, I like to go back to buildings that I've worked on and see how the, what the people are doing. See, see yeah. what happened. Yeah. 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 I mean, architects are control enthusiasts, right? <laughs> Frank, Frank is no exception. Probably at the top he's, of the list. He's right? you know, probably number one on that list. Right. <laughs> on that hit parade. But what was interesting is you say that it's like the, the, about the control of it and what was interesting about, uh, visiting unfortunately angela you know, had to bail but this was while he was there we kind of scored this private tour of a frank lloyd wright house that he didn't get a chance to go to but my wife and i did and even though this is not frank lloyd wright furniture this is essentially where throughout all of the photographs and pictures that the new owners had on there this was where frank lloyd wright wanted a, a couch to be interesting about that is the reason why that was there. You sit down right here at the, the the far end, at one end, and you sit there. Now, you turn back, or like obviously you're facing away from the this back view here, and you're looking kind of like at the breadth of the house. If you sit in that one spot through the clear story, through the way that the, the compression and everything else are, you see the entire house. You see the entire house from the interior spaces, and then you look through the, the clear story and the windows, and you continue to see the house as it moves to the exterior, and you just see everything about it. And you, and, and it was a- You see the idea? It, yes. And you see the, you see that idea, you see that intent that he tried to create in curating, you must sit here. You know, like, if you sit here. You see everything. This is the sweet spot. Yeah, like this is the sweet spot yeah. right here. Yeah. yeah. And you're just like, as to re repeat what Angelo said numerous times about numerous architects on this trip, man, I hate that guy. <laughs> A little jealous. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't jealousy. It was just, it was just hate. It was just hate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. It was, I mean, like... And there's, what was interesting about some of these, and again, yes, we could talk forever, and we're probably, I mean, we're, we're literally still on day one of, of this conversation. And, That's what know, I'm concerned about. And there's, you know, a lot of <laughs> other things. So I'm, I'm curious from Angela, your perspective, like of all of the things we saw, and let me just do kind of like a, a real quick, <laughs> like of a real quick rundown. In Chicago, we saw the Rookery and the Chicago Art and the Pritzker Pavilion and Apple Store. And, the Chicago Tribune building, we went to the the Lesnar house, strolled down Prairie Avenue, the Roby house, although we didn't get a chance to do a tour, but we were like in and around oh. the Roby house. And if somebody would have probably had a, a set, we would have been inside, no problem. But I'm just saying, you know, people who like to try, you know, doors usually get in sometimes. Should have tried the door. <laughs> oh, he did. He did. <laughs> okay. He tried every door. Um, he also like pulled on the gate. Because there's a gate in the back where you go in. Check so, it. You know, I was really checking um, to make sure it was secure. I was, it, I was looking out for them. You know, we did. You know, we did like Quality all of these assurance. like classical things. We went to the the Farnsworth House, U Unity Temple, the the Frank Lloyd Wright House and Studio. We went to eight sixty eight eighty. Then we went to nine hundred nine ten Lakeshore. Both of the Mies projects, and 
we went and saw the People's Gas Pavilion. We saw the Poetry Foundation, which, you know, I think in a way, for a modern building, we were both like just enamored by that. And, you know, the simple moves that just made such a, a beauty. I mean, <laughs> it just, I hate to say it this way, but it was pretty poetic how they like did all of these like, you know, moves on this building that were just so simple, but so elegantly done. And you're just like, yeah, of course, this is the Poetry Foundation building, you know? And and so we had all of these things. And then we went like, there was a lot of like right stuff. And there was a point where he's just like, yeah, I think I'm right out. Write it out. Well, I wasn't cool. write it out on for a couple more days yet. Yeah. I mean, for, for that point, you know, and stuff. But I mean, I'm curious in like the first few days, I mean, what was like some of your highlights that, that you, you know, like really enjoyed? So Detroit, Chicago highlights. Yeah. So like that way. Sure. Yeah. Um, say the poetry foundation, I think was a highlight in, in Chicago. I, I actually enjoyed, I, this was a highlight and maybe because of the conversation we had was the whole millennium park. So <laughs> being at, I you know, you because I, this to me. I know, I know. Because be, one, this is when we actually coined, coined the phrase idea and execution, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And at that point, we, we were talking around it, but we hadn't kind of gotten to that phrase yet. It, it's also where we started talking about, you know, the success of that, uh, that next person coming in. But really where we coined it was when we walked into um, uh, Gary's Pavilion, right? <laughs> and idea fantastic fantastic but there were some things that we questioned about how how it was done could it have been done more elegantly um and i think anytime you're talking about gary that's going to come up but in this in particular this idea of a place where you can go listen to music that is this informal pavilion in the middle of chicago with these you know vertical towers in the background Beautiful idea, right? The Chicago Museum of Art, this very light sort of delicate thing sitting in the middle of this park uh, connected to the old building. Beautiful idea. In, in Renzo's building, how it was weathering, I was, I was a little taken aback because of the rust, because of the streaking, because of, you know, things that I hadn't, that it had time kind of was taking its, was doing its thing on that building. And in, the, in this one, just in the way the the things came to the ground, the way those arcs just kind of were held up by these piers, could it have been done a little bit more elegantly? And so this is really when we started talking about, okay, great idea. What do we think about how it was done? And, and this goes, I think, go, went beyond nitpicking, but this was a choice Yeah, right here. This was a choice. Um, and it wasn't, I don't explain think explain what you're, what you're, what you're, so for people who aren't looking at okay. something right now, explain so, what, what we're looking at. So, oh. you know, we kind of what Angela was talking about. And so let me set a little bit more of this is like, we were kind of texting back and forth with, uh, you know, one of our, um, one of the principals at the firm, um, Adam Gross, one of the names on the door. And we were talking about, um, it's like I, I had sent him some pictures because we had talked about Cranbrook a lot because he's one of the planner gurus. And so he, he absolutely loves Cranbrook. And so like I sent him a picture of, of Angelo and I there and, and, you know, we, we had talked about that and he's just like, oh, it's amazing that you guys are doing this. What is uh, on your itinerary? And so we started to kind of like feed him a little bit of like the itinerary. And he's like, oh, if you're going here, then you got to go to the Pritzker Pavilion by Gary. And, you know, the funny thing is, is as many times as I've been to Chicago, I've been to the Bean and all of these other things, but there was either events or something else that had the the actual pavilion blocked off. And so I never actually went to it. I've seen pictures of it and things like that. And so you see this and you see this kind of like this big trellis, yeah. you know, and you look at it and you're like, and then without keeping this a family friendly show, when we like rounded the corner and we looked at it and I said, what the is that, you know, bleepity bleepity bleep bleeps because as elegant as this kind of very swoopy band shell is, and I get the idea of this kind of like very light trellis to kind of 
open up the view and kind of like have this kind of like almost counterpoint to like all of these very vertical skyscrapers and everything. But the way that he chose to kind of like just terminate it, it almost seemed like a cop out. It, it, it seemed like he like forgot that, oh, and I have to find a way to make these come to ground. And the, I, I started, I started looking at this in the lens of things like how, how, how Trava, you know, brings his, his big swooping arches and stuff down to ground and all of these other different people, how they like meet the ground. And then you look at this and you just like, I know that there's a big concrete sonic tube behind that wrapped in stainless steel, but you then now have this structural steel above it, which if you can, you know, can sort of see is rusting and flaking and falling apart. And it just, you know, it, it, it's it, not his fault. It, it, <laughs> it is building maintenance. It no, is. it's the owner. No, the no, owner has is. to take care of the architecture. Choice. Come on, you can't. Idea. No, what? Idea what? You're gonna. You're gonna. Execution. You're gonna. Idea you're gonna versus powder execution. coat a 100 foot wide piece of steel structure. No. 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 Not that. But but I think it's it's interesting. I'm these columns, like you. they don't look bad in the photo. These columns don't look bad in the photo. And I and I'm trying to imagine what these columns would look like in California. They're, and they <laughs> would be eight times that size in California because of the the jack plate that you would have to have for the for the <laughs> size for plate. this to work Oops. <laughs> <laughs> this was better view but i mean you know it was just like this like it was a letdown to me that it was just like yeah oh, mm. like it was yeah. you were you were like it was right there and it was just like there there like i've seen so many things that he's done has got this like elegant transition to the ground and then this one was just like it literally to yeah. me felt like a toupee kind of like flopping in the breeze of some dude well, this, riding his bike down the road. Dude, it, this comes across to me like like this is a project that is like a thirty thousand foot view project. And then when you get to where it touches the ground, it's like, oh. Right. Right. It, yeah, it, but, this is one of those things where it's it's way more idea than execution is what exactly exactly. Yes. And yeah, that yeah. and again, this is where the evolution came from. This was where No, I have seen this last time I was here when we this was this was filled with people. And so I don't recall seeing and, these peers. And, and again, they're not like people, people aren't paying probably attention. probably disappear with all the people there. Again, yeah. people, yeah. yeah, you're right. People aren't paying attention to this. They're not looking up and seeing the, the paint flaking off of it no. and the, the steel rusting and all of this other stuff. But <laughs> you're too much of a project architect sometimes, Ooh. right? Like it's, it's keeping you from the experience. And not only that, but like you can't experience if you're not in like the actual use case of the facility too, right? Like, well, like Angelo is saying, if you're there in a concert, I bet it's like incredible, right? But, but when it's like this and you're just walking through it and there's that, that energy isn't there, that uh, th it's not alive like it is during a concert and you're staring at you and then and now you're like staring at the stuff and it's just and, getting and i'm enjoying and i'm enjoying pitting you against you two against each other oh <laughs> we, we, we do it we do it we've been doing it for 12 years so just beyond just beyond this and you can't see it in this photo but just beyond this there are these concrete walls where the metal from from the the, the stands kind of stop these concrete walls kind of pick up and it's like well well Okay, I, I I get you're you're, right. you're what you're trying to do here, but was that the right choice? Yeah. So because it could have just it could have just continued on. Everything else is coming down and sitting on this concrete. Um, and and again, perhaps nitpicky. I think I think as an idea and as it's fantastic. It's just when it's not full of people. To your point, but some things but, jump out. But at hear you. hear me out. There's there's two there's two different things about this that that kind of didn't sit well with me. And it wasn't the place. It wasn't the space. The space, I get what it is intended to be and everything else. But what I'm looking at is I'm looking at this very kind of like dramatic band shell and everything else. And then I look at it as two kind of separate projects. The band shell is one thing. The, the, the trellis that holds the lighting and the speakers and all of that other stuff. I understand that it's got to be robust and hold up and like high winds and, and everything maintained. else. But Chicago does have extreme weather, if I'm not mistaken. They yeah. they sort of do. But when we're, so, you know, we'll put this in the lens of architects who are trying to design for permanence. And you look at other buildings that we had been touring, you know, we, we toured the Rookery building and we were looking at all of these other things. And you're real, you're, 
you're looking at it in the lens of something that had been there for, you know, 50, 60, 100 years, you know, 150 years. And you look at this and you see, oh, I've been here for like 10 years and I'm already starting to rust and corrode and all of these other things. And it's just like, there's almost the sense of design irresponsibility that, you know, you... I wonder if it was supposed to be that permanent. I mean, in, I don't know, in, I don't know the know, answer again, to that, but... You know, I don't know that, this, but like... I think about like this and I think of a World's Fair kind of a thing, right? And it's like, oh, this yeah. is going to... Like the Eiffel Tower, this is going to go away. And, and, oh, nope, it's still there. I so mean, we, now we got to deal with it. <laughs> so we asked this question, we asked this question a couple times and I don't know that I came up with a good answer. Like, all right, do this. What else would it be? Counterpoint, mm. later on in the day, we went to uh, People's Gas Pavilion, which was made out of wood, which, beautiful. We saw it at a perfect time of day, dusk. You look back and you get that iconic view of the city beyond it, and it was beautiful, well-executed project. But it's wood, right? It's mm -hmm. laminated wood, and I mm -hmm. think we had gotten there just shortly after it had been um, renovated. That's the Genie so, Gang project? Yeah. Okay. And so it, we were seeing it, we could kind of smell the um the, the refinishing yeah yeah so we were seeing it probably in its best condition other than probably when it first opened mm -hmm. this is this is a photo you took right yeah. i mean this is not anything off of the it, again fantastic glorious but is that the right material choice for chicago it seems to be holding up well um but mm. again, we're seeing it for the first time. It might take, it, they may, they may be more proactive about their maintenance. <laughs> they, they might be, they might be, but this is one of those ones that you look at it and you're like, look at the way that they, it meets, touch, the, it meets the, ground. the ground in those right. kind of like really well thought out, Elegant. you know, kind of like transitions to, to the base. And, and it was just like looking at that and then coming to this later to the people's gas pavilion, you're just like, well, they could do it here. Why couldn't they do it there? And then, so mm -hmm. I kind of got hung up on like looking at these transitions. So when we started maybe, going to. Maybe, maybe she did look at how it met the ground. I was like, I can do better. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, very well could be. Um, yeah. But it was it's just this, and yes, scale wise, this is much smaller, much, much, much smaller. Yeah. Um, not the same thing. You know, it is not the same thing. And it's. You know, beautiful but i mean this was a highlight i would say you asked you asked the highlights this was a highlight i yeah. would say um not not only not only um w not only seeing it but when we saw it yeah right at mm -hmm. dusk you know this this and we and we didn't plan this again this was one of those that was like if we, if we have time let's go see this and as right. we were heading out we we kind of it's, it's right there let's go and so we we kind of peeled off and went and saw this and so this was this was really well done um, nice. I, yeah, I, this was a highlight, I would say. Yeah, pavilions just are so cool. Yeah. 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 Pavilions. Yeah. You so can I do mean, whatever you want. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> yeah. it was just beautiful. This was where probably one of the hardest times that I had laughed on the, <laughs> on the trip. <laughs> well, I put you in a hot spot. You can tell the story if you want. <laughs> so we, so we pull up, he's driving, we pull up to, uh, you know, um, put the card like because it was at Lincoln Park and it was also awesome. just by saying I'm not that short I don't I think I'm T-Rex normal his height. little T-Rex normal arms. height and he's trying to like reach out there and he just <laughs> he just like the it was the ticket like for a normal size person would just like reach out put the put the credit card in get their ticket and there and here he is he's like stretched he couldn't get to it had to open the door to basically get up and he wasn't that it was on lifts it was an accessible design uh, yeah no, we'll go with no, that no you had you had to get out of your seat to kind of reach the no, you had to get out of your seat we everyone would have had to have jumped out of their seat unless all right <laughs> but it was it, it definitely in in town i mean as this kind of, it was this interesting, beautiful little folly in the middle of yeah. um, Lincoln Park. And at dusk, you know, Angelo's right, at dusk when you're seeing it with the, that dusk lighting, lighting. and everything yeah. else. And just that, the beautiful kind of like honey colored wood kind of like, and now you've got the silhouette of the trees and the lake and stuff. And then rising above that, beyond that is the city. And you see like um, 
the Hancock building and all of this other stuff. And it was just this, this beautiful layering. You think back to like, you know, what, you know, Saarinen did at Crayon mm -hmm. and you think about like all of these different layering effects. And it's another one of these kind of like talking about the, the threshold and kind of like creating these kind of like these views, these threshold views or these physical thresholds and things like that, that just kind of kept seeming to like reoccur as we're going through all of these spaces because they were places and spaces. They were like, you know, they, they worked on the mm -hmm. collective whole. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm a jewel box sitting here all by itself and it's ignoring everything else. All of the successful projects that we visited were, were part of the fabric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Poetry Foundation was like that. There was yeah. layers to that, just layers of transparency. You're looking through that, that, that perforated metal through a garden into a library. It was just, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the more successful ones, I think, placed you within your environment and allowed you to be connected beyond just the spot that it was sitting on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've talked about projects a lot in the context of the building doesn't, the, the project doesn't stop at the property line. Right. It's like, right. how are you a good neighbor? How do you contribute to the community of things? Like, how are you reacting to, but also proactive of who comes next kind of a thing like you, you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier? Like, there's all of these different aspects when it comes to a project that architects have to take into consideration when they're doing design work In that... A lot of people don't think of like they're, they're used nice to like to okay like like an infill project like a lot of people just think of every project as an infill project like what's happening from here in instead yeah. of from here this imaginary line we have around our property outward and how we present right. ourselves and are we are we part of the neighborhood are we part maybe, of the community yeah. maybe butcher this but wasn't it Chicago and Burnham who said you have to consider the projects two scales out mm. as well as right. two scale. I can't remember how he said it, but well, I, I always think back to the very first. It was pretty pretty positive. It was the very first day of architecture school, and my professors showed Powers of Ten, and for mm -hmm. those of you who are not familiar with it, is the Eames movie, uh, Powers of Ten, and it's this kind of like macro view, micro view, zooming in, zooming out, and what I learned from that was is that. You've got to look at the big picture. You've got to look at the small picture. You've got to look at the details. And the Poetry Foundation was really interesting as a counterpoint to, say, Renzo's Art Museum edition, because where there were some big moves, big concepts, and there were some similarities in the screening and all of these other like aspects, it was, okay, you've got these big moves. Now, how do you transition down to, say, the, the smaller details? And, you know, there was, there was one where at, at Renzo's building, and let me, let me preface this by, I, I am an admirer of, of Renzo and the detailing and the, the rigor and everything else. This was probably the most disappointing one on the trip for me because I had, because I am so enamored with the New York Times building and, and the beautiful detail and everything else that he does. And then you go to that one and you're just like, it doesn't, it's not holding up, it's rusting, there's staining, there's this, 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 this almost material ir irresponsibility in a way. And, but, mm -hmm. you know, and you see like this screen and then the screen comes down and it stops and the, but that the water's going to continue to like roll down and hit the ground. And so now there's like the staining and cracking on the concrete and stuff. But then in the poetry foundation, they have a similar thing. They've got the screen coming down. And they just did one simple, one simple difference between what they did and what Renzo did was they transitioned like, oh, I'm going to put a channel a, a little gutter right beneath that because I know I'm going to, I know it rain is going to be coming down through here and puddly sure. and all of that other stuff. So let me capture it, but capture it in such a beautiful little detail because, okay, yeah, it's a gutter, but it's also this shadow line that kind of transitioned you from the building to the the public realm you're moving from the private to the public it's just this simple like shadow line this this dark like line that when we're drawing things and we're drawing like this figure ground or a site plan or something and we do this big heavy line between like our building and the landscape whether they intended it to be this way or not it was it that's what it happened to be is like it was this big heavy line 
that kind of drew all of this stuff. And it was just simple little moves that they did that was just like really amazing. I was completely baffled or, or not baffled, awe, uh, awe in, you know, just like in awe. This is their gate to close it off for the day is they have basically the panels in the sidewalk lift up. It's like a drawbridge. You like a drawbridge. Yep. And lift up and close it off. And no, you can't squeeze this, around. You know it what this is? Some this this is those those uh, those things that that lift up on the aircraft carrier deck that the the aircraft uses yeah. its thrusters against to get to get off the the deck. But I mean, it was just it was that's just like you know, cool. like well done. Like it, I I looked at it and I'm just like that's amazing. Like other people would be like you know, hey, how do we do a gate here? We need to put a gate here. How do we do a gate here? And some people would put a gate. Or something like that. Yeah, for sure. When this goes down, when you they're wouldn't, open you wouldn't even think twice about it. Yeah, you wouldn't even think twice about it. You would put a gate there. Exactly. And then in <laughs> in here, you know, you 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 the the sidewalk comes up during you know at night when we're closed, and then during the day it goes down, and you have this kind of like free passage and everything else, and it just yeah, it's just cool. these simple little moves, and it's just. You know, like it's a simple transparency. <laughs> but you have to say, you have to add the asterisk that say, simple little moves that cost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> why you, why you got to be like that? Because you know? it's the truth. <laughs> Believe me, Is there as a designer, I want to spend money? all the money. Exactly. Like that's the job. Uh -oh. We got to spend all the money. So, but you have to give up something else to do something yeah, like that. Yeah, so he's so. like, is, is. I tried that door too, by the way. Yeah, he he did. <laughs> he tried all the doors, all the doors. In this beautiful, like little transparency between like the public realm of people going by on a busy mm -hmm. street and all this other stuff, and you're in the courtyard, and you almost like, feel this separation between the serenity of the courtyard and the busy hustle of the street and stuff. I mean, I totally agree with Angela that it it really was because it's just simple moves. It was really a highlight because. It's one of those things, it's like anybody could do it, just people aren't. And you just kind of like, oh, I wish you were, mm -hmm. you know. So J John Ronan uh, was the architect of that. Yeah. Um, so uh, d we left there and made our way towards Farnsworth at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. If if we were thinking, if we weren't, if we had planned this a little bit better, we would have stayed the night in Chicago. But mm. uh, we had an early tour um, at Farnsworth, so we were, thought it would be better to kind of beat traffic and kind of get out that way. Um, so next, so we kind of went towards Farnsworth, um, found a place to sleep, um, and the next day we actually took a slight detour. Atlas Obscura is an app, both. Uh, both of us use, and well, he does we too. found two. <laughs> well, all three of us uh, found a, a windmill and um, a Viking ship. Wow! We, we did not get to the Viking ship. Yeah, well, it was it was just outside of our timetable. But the windmill was. Um, you're going to go back to that Viking ship. Nah, right? I've got to go back to that Viking ship, of course. You know, I mean, how can you <laughs> wow. not? Like, there's a Viking ship in the middle of you know rural Illinois. Why? That's cool. Why not stop and see it? You need to know the story of yeah. that. Yeah. Very cool. So was that the one that they sailed to the Chicago's World Fair? Yes. World Fair. They built it. They so the Scandinavian countries for the the Scandinavian installation at the Chicago World's Fair. They built it for that, and they sailed it across the Atlantic, and it was part of the exhibition, and then it just stayed here. And yeah. now, for some reason, somehow, some way, it has landed, um, both literally and figuratively, into in rural Illinois. Wow! You're cool. like, what? But okay. How? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Farnsworth was uh, it was it was worth going to. The stories were, you know, the age old story of the architect and potentially. Um, I don't know. Potentially inappropriate relationship with client that ends in disaster. Um, I don't know how many times we've we've we heard that story on these tours, but um, this this was this one was interesting. Um, uh, this was a Mies van der Rohe house, perhaps his most famous house, I would say, other than the Barcelona Pavilion, which again pavilions are cool. Um, but but this one. This was interesting for me because it floods like what every ten years or so. Yeah, yeah, and 
and and they're if they want to preserve it, they were saying they they want to preserve the integrity of of its place where it was built. I get that, but man, just move it up the hill a little. Yeah, because <laughs> it was originally designed and budgeted for forty two thousand dollars at the end of it because Edith Florence Worth, basically this was when she started getting into a battle with, with Meese, is she had stayed there and she basically was supposedly close to being finished. And she was like finding all of these issues with the glass and with the finishes and all of that other stuff. And so she was mm -hmm. just like, no, absolutely not. This, is, this isn't ready for public or my consumption. And beautiful and elegant and everything else but the cost of preservation of that of this pavilion over its lifetime and it's not that long of a lifetime is astronomical i mean sure. we're talking i was ten, gonna say it probably costs forty two thousand dollars a month ten, well it's <laughs> tens of tens of billion of millions of dollars I almost said billion but millions of dollars that they've spent on the restoration preservation preservation then yeah. restoration more restoration, fixing, flooding, all of this other stuff throughout the course of this, where the, the building was almost submerged in, in everything else. And, and then they were just like, well, how are we going to protect this? And it's just like, well, let's build a platform where we like put it underneath the platform and raise it up when it starts to flood. And because like right outside from the stairs, when you're looking out, you're looking out at this river and the river basically floods and you're basically sitting as you can see in the photographs that we're showing it's sitting down at the bottom of the hill so it's yeah. sitting in the floodplain mm -hmm. and could it have easily been moved up the hill and completely avoided all of that sure there's a lot of property on here that still kind of maintains it but this is actually the second site didn't they move it already once um I said the second side. I, I thought they said, it, it, I could be wrong. I know. But anyway, it's it's just one of these things that like, you know, it's, trust me, it is elegant. It is beautiful. It, it, it caused me to ask a question of what makes buildings loved? Because here you have this masterpiece. Here you have something that we as the world have put the moniker of this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is something that we are going to maintain and we're going to dump whatever kind of money that we can into this building to save and preserve this building. Why? Why have, why have we chosen this to be the loved one in other buildings mm -hmm. not loved the same way? Is it because of Mies? Is it because of the story? Is it what makes it? And it wasn't necessary. This was one of those that kind of caused me to ask that. And then we're looking at when we were walking around the, the very last building that we actually went to. So I'll jump ahead to day five. The very last building that we went to was Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin in, in, in mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And in there, what was interesting about that one is because yes, they are undergoing a lot of preservation on it. And here we are walking around and Angelo said earlier, like the the environment, the weather, everything kind of makes the experience. So here we are. Every day had been this amazing day, except for the very mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. day. And it's just torrential raining. And we get to the Taliesin and it's just showing all of its flaws. It is leaking inside the building. It, you kind of over accentuate the sagging and all of this other stuff. And it's just still an amazing space. But, you know, yeah. you're just like... Again, why are people dumping tens of millions, potentially hundreds of millions, think about falling water and how much money they dumped into that to preserve and protect that and rebuild it and things like that. When then, as we're standing at the Farnsworth and we're walking around and of course doing the very typical architect thing of looking at the details and all of that other stuff, we're asking ourselves, we're asking each other, it's just like, how can you achieve this building in today's technology and by today's codes, by today's energy standards and all of this other stuff, would it have the same kind of like feel? Would it have the same kind of expression as it does now um, or it did back then? What can you do to kind of like make these modern masterpieces, these modern masterpieces like this, how can you do that today? And 
There was all these other things. But it's just a, there was this big conversation, Evan, that we were having yeah, about. Th- well, so this is different. of a time. Yeah. Right. Like, and yeah. and and to me, like, so before I went into architecture school, I'd never seen this this project. Yeah. When I saw it, it changed my mind about architecture. Like, it was just like <laughs> it was one of those projects where it's like you can do what you can. I had no concept that that buildings could be like this. Yeah. And so like on a visceral level as an architect who who learned that at a young age, I like I understand completely why this is a protected place, yeah. right? And and it is of a time and I don't think buildings should be raised and replaced with the new modern version, right? And I don't think you're advocating no, for no, that, no, but you may all. be advocating yep. for this to become an Atlas Obscura site. Um, if, you know, just just perpetually under 10 feet of water, it'd be a really cool ruin. It would right? be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would but, be pretty cool. But like, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's a really interesting conversation. I think that there there are places where you think about that and there are a lot of places you don't think right. about that, right? Like it, this is one of those that just has so much lore around it because of all of the reasons that you cited. Yeah. Was it the architect? Was it the relationship? Was it, is it the project? Like, is it the time? Is it the place? It's like, there's so many layers to this story mm-hmm. and, yeah. and all of that I think is. So then go back to the Pritzker Pavilion and you look at that and you're just like, I can see that this, looks feels and can really be temporary like this yeah. w- this won't be saved some of it might be saved. not every architecture needs to be yeah. yeah right and and that was like that that what makes it lovable you know like mm-hmm. oh let's skip and pass a lot of the 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 things we did see we saw a lot of frank lloyd wright and a lot of frank lloyd wright they told that story that i hate which is when we went to talia which is he kind of went and saw falling water and then went back and apparently did not work on it. And then, uh, the owner happened to be doing some business in Milwaukee and called him up and said, Hey, I'm on my way. And I want to see the the genius, the genius arrived. He sits there and whips it out and like, and I remember my first day of architecture school, um, Brian Kelly told that story as we were all sitting in the auditorium and he, and he told that story and he's like, they tell that story when you visit and they want you to, to know, to understand the genius of, of, of that, that architect. But what folks didn't know was that he had another studio in his house where he would sit and kind of work and churn through versions of this. So when he drew it, it was not the first time he was drawing it. And, and his, yeah. his point was that, obviously, there's a lot of hard work that people don't see that goes into all of right. this. Right. And subconscious cranking. Like, like right. there's you can't put an apparent value on... All of the work that we do, just cranking away in the depths of your mind, and right. then you spit it out on the page at some point because you have to. Right? But but the point there, though, the point though is the one thing that we're skipping past that Frank Lloyd Wright did was he brought a story and showmanship to totally. architecture. Right. That you're talking about all of this embedded lore in this particular building, and I, I got to think that that's part of it. And that's and then we talked about. Uh, uh, on the trip, why is Frank Lloyd Wright this world-renowned architect? Does anyone else have a trail? Any ar- other architects have a trail dedicated to them that you he's kind an of amazing go, salesman? Oh. Yeah, he's a showman. Yeah, and and it's yeah. and it's 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 got to be part of it, right? Right. Absolutely. And so, but he, to 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 go back to your point, you know that these modern masterpieces do they have that story? Do they have that? that 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 show that potentially goes with them to make the modern masterpieces or do they stand on their own in the way kind of did you know all the stories evan when when you first saw this it just no. was strong enough on its own to just visually stand there striking and, yeah yeah yeah. Right. yeah so i think probably a little bit of both i think it, it seeps into the consciousness of the public who don't really i don't know maybe they consume architecture the same way we do on a subconscious level maybe they don't but I think all of that plays into it in making these these spaces. And I think that's why, Frank, and we skipped past a lot of the places we went to him. I think that's part of what made him so uh, part of the fabric of society and architecture as we know it is all of that showmanship. Right. Is all of that, that, that other things that he put into it that were, that was not just part of the architecture. And shows in his architecture, though. His architecture does have a showiness to it. 
Yeah. What was interesting yeah. about almost all of the places that we visited and we toured is they were well attended tours. People yeah. were coming out. There was tons of people on the Farnsworth tour. And we we're talking that they had to make a trek to drive out. To they the weren't Farnsworth. in your photos. Well, good job. <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> if I wanted people in my photos, I would have designed exactly. them. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But I mean, which is, it's this, like, I don't, so, so we met a, at the Farnsworth house. What was amazing is we, we met a studio from Sao Paulo that here they are as a studio, they travel with the entire studio and they go to different places each year to experience architecture. And so here they are traveling and it's not just, oh, the principals went and maybe a couple of senior people. It was all of them. <laughs> and it was interesting to listen to and see their reaction to the, to the place, how each generation of architect was reading it differently. We met, we met a family at, from England who the dad was there and the mom was there. And then their two grown sons were there. And one of them was an architect. And like, we, we bumped into them a couple of different places and even told them, it was like, Hey, if you're, you know, still around, there's another tour going on here. And it was kind of amazing to like, kind of like meet these people and share like this experience with them. And that was kind of like the interesting thing is because we were seeing them from a variety of different lenses, lenses of architects, lenses of people who just appreciate good work. And just like people who would not normally be, I don't know, it's just, there was the draw, there was this desire to be there and to see these, these works and pieces and things like that. I don't know if it was, I, I don't know what other people's mindset was. It was kind of interesting to kind of like see, and I, you know, you could tell, and Angela and I were like walking around talking and it was just like, I, I was standing on the platform at, at Farnsworth and a lot of the, that firm was like there. And I was just like, so architects. What do you think? Because it was just like, you knew they were architects and you knew that they would, it was just, and then it just sparked a conversation about like, not only like who we are and all that other stuff, but how other people like are viewing this work. I mean, we grow up as going through the American schools for architecture and we're learning about these like American masterpieces and stuff. But here's somebody that went through school in South America and they're here visiting these American masterworks. And telling us about the, telling us their impressions of these spaces and these places and things like that. And then, then they're saying, it's like, oh, and we spent time in Toronto or we did this or we did that. It was just, just kind of amazing to kind of like see this kind of collective love for all of these spaces that we went to. That was yeah. something when, when we went on a, just recently, when I took at the AIA convention and I took a couple of people over to the um, Pope Leahy house and we were probably the only three architects at this, but here is the day of Frank Lloyd Wright's birthday. There's this whole big celebration going on. There's cake at the, at the um, place and there's kids, there's adults, there's teenagers, there's all these different people. And it was packed, um, at the, at this small little house of people who wanted to be at good places, a good space. Interesting. I, I have a, I have a, I, I'm going to do what, what we do here, Angela, which I'm going to, I'm going to bring this full circle. All right. So something that, that Cormac mentioned early on, and we all, I think have ups and downs in our careers. It sounded like there's a, a dip going on, right. With this disillusionment with the profession of architecture, probably, probably not architecture itself, but just like the practice of architecture. We all go through that. I'm just wondering what this tour did for you. Like what, how do you feel after going on this whirlwind architectural tour, did it reinvigorate you? Did it re-excite you? Did it, did it, is it just unobtainable to get to this level? Like how, how does, how did it affect you as a, as an architect? Well, it, it was, I would say it would, there was some reinvigoration. It was less that it was out of reach and more so that it is attainable, that it's not as far out of reach as we think. I think, you know, seeing, I think it was nice to sprinkle in some of these modern pieces and see what's achievable here. I think if it was all old stuff, I'm old in quotation marks, yeah. I think it would have been more so that this is unobtainable. That happened then. It's not going to happen now. And the, that happened with these characters. But to see 
work being done now that I would hold up to some of these masterpieces, I think was the invigorating part, the part that made me feel like, yeah, we, we can do this stuff now. We can do things that generate the same sorts of conversations, mm. uh, same sort of excitement, and really provide spaces that allow life to happen, which is really what I think I'm trying to do, right, is create a space where people can live and have experiences and ha and create memories discoveries if it's a laboratory you know um i'm trying to provide the opportunity for life to happen mm -hmm. in in a building um and so i think seeing both of these side by side and then um unfortunately i couldn't make that last trip but then to know that people regular everyday people are still living in these places um that you got to visit um i think was also a part of it and and probably a reason why I didn't want to quite see it. I, I wanted to I wanted it to, to, to be in my, my mind as something that was um uh a little bit more romantic than than what I might have seen if I had been there. Um You you're editing. You're you were like editing your experience. Yeah. <laughs> like a little preemptively. Bit. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um but yeah, it, it 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 made me feel like it was actually more attainable than less. Right. Because as much as I was like, I hate this guy, it wasn't like it was so far away. Right. Right. And, and as I much think as that I is, that's a really interesting point. I feel like that too. Like there's amazing work that you can go visit. You can go on these tours and you can feel like you could do it too. I mean, mm -hmm. I really do feel like, like we have all the tools. We, we, the the magic is finding the right client. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the right but client. But you really can. It is attainable. It is achievable. But it's still it's still really hard. But it's I hard. think you still feel like the possibility and the opportunities are there. Yeah. I mean, because so like the very first time I ever went to Glenstone, Angela was by my side. Another friend of ours was by our side, and in looking at that as kind of a modern masterwork, in my opinion. And just seeing that, yeah, you, you know, these are attainable, like this is an attainable goal, creating a place and a space, you know, creating something that has kind of that similar dynamic to say a, you know, maybe not a Cranbrook, but something like that, that has this like language of it's not just the little built environment, like the little building itself, but it's how it's integrated into the landscape, how it kind of creates and tells this whole story around all of these other like all the other assemblage and everything else. I mean, it just like, you know, those, those prove to me that things like say the Farnsworth house and other things are, we can do those. Yeah. There, there's this quote, it's like this lost interview with Steve Jobs. So it's, it's kind of informal, feels a little casual. And one of his epiphanies, I think in life was just when he was like realizing that the people he really looked up to who were doing incredible things were just like him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and just, but, but very few people are motivated to take things to that level. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And so being motivated to do that, I mean, that's really where we see these projects coming out of, right? It's like how much time and effort does it take? It takes a lot to put the level of attention to detail into these projects. And, just to like for, first to have the understanding, but then to the idea to the execution, right? Like that is a huge commitment yeah. and it is a long road, but, but I mean, that motivation is what makes these things master works. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's where it really, and, and just the stars have to align and there's all kinds of magic in there. Right. But, but, but that really is, you know, the budgets, the, the taste, the materials, the contractor, the, you know, like there's just so many pieces to that puzzle, but, um, it is possible. And I, I, I love like kind of getting that out of you guys throughout this process. Cause you're, first of all, you're, you're doing something that a lot of architects won't do. They just don't have time in quotes to go out and do something like this and to do it and to walk away with, from it and think like, uh, this is reinvigorating. This is this reinvigorated the thing that I think I'm here to do, you know, my purpose, the, the meaningful work that I want to do. Um, so I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to share it because uh, not, not very many people get to do it. And I hope this inspires others to figure out a, a tour of their own and, yeah. and go into it with an intention 
of you know trying to get something out of it b- bigger than just the visit, right? right. So because right. Cormac and I have talked for years about how enriching this is to your what you bring to projects when you can do things outside of the office and to en- to round out your life and and that makes you a more valuable teammate on a project. Right. You know one thing, and I don't know in editing where y'all want to insert this, but. It was nice seeing a lot of the Frank Lloyd Wright projects because you could see the progression of one person's career. Seeing his house, you could see the kernels of ideas that made it into, you know, into other buildings um, where you could see him testing little things here and there. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I'll try this here at my house where (laughs) I'm my client. But then, for instance, um, a dumb example is... The piano that sits halfway in the wall and above the stairs and then you see him try to do that again in wing spread where he inserts the, the the dining room table in between the two you know um in between the kitchen and the serving area and that's just a, a very direct example but there were lots of little little kernels of ideas in that house that you go to another building and you look at it and you're like oh that that's where he and so i feel like One's career can be that, right? Where you you you're you're always striving. It's a sort of like, duh, sort of like America, right? Where you're always striving for a more perfect union, right? You're, yeah, you're always right. striving for a better solution. And each every project is going to have a lesson that you're going to learn that hopefully um, allows you to get better on the next one, which eventually hopefully leads to a few masterpieces or uh, at yeah. least just one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, maybe yeah. there, may, I know there were a lot of projects you didn't talk about, so maybe we can do a part two sometime. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I, cool. I, I enjoyed this. And we still need to figure out that whole uh, Star Wars scroll at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Evan, it was, it's good meeting you, and thanks for having me. 